Hi, this is Bob Magna, president of the Rockefeller Institute. I want to welcome folks back. And for folks that are just joining us, uh, welcome them to our next panel, which is uh, perspectives on the drug policy issues from the New York state government. We do have the two most prominent legislators um, who deal with these issues on a daily basis and chair the relevant committees. So we have Senator Pete Harcum with us. He's of Dutchess Putnam, Westchester counties and Assemblyman Phil Steck, uh, who represents Albany and Schenectady counties, parts of. Um, as I mentioned, Senator Harcum and Assemblyman Steck are both chairs of their respective committees on alcoholism and substance abuse. Um, both are working daily with their constituents and with their communities to address these issues. Again, personally and as the Institute, I'd like to thank both of them for taking the time, um, their valuable time to spend some time with us on this issue. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Senator Harkin. Bob, thank you so much. And, and thanks to the Rockefeller Institute for hosting such an important symposium. I want to thank all of the speakers, um, just incredible speakers. Uh, Rob Kent, my good friend who has taught me so much. Big loss to the state, but a great gain uh, to our nation and the federal government in his new role. Um, and, and we're just so proud of, of Rob and all that he's accomplished. Um, great to be with, with my colleague and my, my partner, Phil Steck, as, as we join you today. Um, just first, I'll share something personal, which, which I speak about often. I'm in long-term recovery myself. So this is a, a personal issue for me. This is my tribe. And, and I'm really um, pleased to chair the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, also founding co-chair of the Senate Task Force on Opioids Addiction and Overdose Prevention. We've had um, probably nine or 10 public hearings through the task force. We have another one up in Albany next week. We've had dozens of roundtables. Uh, and personally, I've had scores of meetings uh, from the tip of Montauk to the, the uh, city of Buffalo and everywhere in between multiple times. Uh, been to Canada to witness supervised consumption sites. So we're constantly out hearing from all of you um, what's working, what's not working, what the holes are, what we need to do from a policy perspective. As, as someone in recovery and as someone in this role, I just want for other people kind of the, the assets and the tools I had for a successful recovery. And that's access to insurance, access to treatment, access to healthcare, access to aftercare, access to medication, um, and then the other social determinants of health, good housing, access to transportation, employment, education, and so on and so on. So we have made some strides in New York over the last several years. For instance, we've doubled treatment times before insurance companies could do co concurrent reviews from 14 days to 28 days. Um, we've made strides in strengthening our parity protections for behavioral health versus physical health. Um, we've made great strides working with our colleagues in, in the assembly um, on expanding the use of medication assisted treatment on Narcan, on other harm reduction measures. Um, but there's so much more that we can do and that we must do. Uh, I should also say um, I'm really grateful um, to have the new governor as a partner. You know, this is a very personal issue for her too. Um, and just in the few weeks that she's been in office, we've had many conversations, both personally and with her staff. Uh, and I think she's really going to be a positive agent for change, um, working collaboratively with, with the legislature. So I, I think that's a boom. Some of the things that we need to do. You know, just as the state was slow to evolve in adapting medication assisted treatment, I think we've been slow to adapt in a, an integrated system of care. So much of this revolves around co occurring mental health disorders. That's why people medicate in the first place. That's why they relapse because they're still self medicating those untreated uh, mental health disorders. So we need to rapidly move to an integrated system of care 
Both our patients and our providers have been navigating an antiquated and Byzantine system with separate funding sources, separate paperwork, separate rules and regulations. So one of the ways to get there, I advocate merging OASIS and OMH. So we have one integrated behavioral health agency. Uh, let's strip away um, all of the bureaucracy. Let's strip away the separate funding streams. And we have one system of integrated care. Another thing that is a big problem across the board has to do with the workforce crisis. We have underpaid our providers for a long, long time, and they're having a hard time keeping both retaining and keeping qualified folks. So we can have all the bed space and all the treatment slots in New York State, but unless we have the ability to pay them and they have the ability to retain those folks, um, those slots are, are not helping. You know, on the recovery side, and I say this, we have kind of the four-legged stool that we deal with. We have treatment, we have recovery, we have harm reduction, and we have prevention. So those were a couple of the major issues that we see on, on the treatment side. On the recovery side, housing is, is a big, big deal. When people come out of treatment or they're in early outpatient treatment, if they're in the same you know, bad housing situations they were in or they have to go back to those housing situations, um, it, it usually means trouble. So we need to find a way to fund recovery housing. Currently, we can't really reimburse recovery housing. We have money in the state budget for um, wraparound services for the, the you know, chronically, um, uh, chronically unemployed or chronically homeless who suffer from either mental, mental health issues or substance use disorder, but we don't have money for plain old recovery housing. That is vital. We also need money for transportation. Uh, there's a little bit of me Medicaid money that allows people to go to appointments, but recovery is so much more holistic. Therapy, doctor's appointments, employment, child care, all of these things that, that are important for successful recovery after treatment um, we need to find a way to fund. One of the things that we did in last year's budget was we funded two pilot projects, one for rural areas and one for some of our urban transportation deserts. We need to do a lot more in that area. On the harm reduction side, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in supervised consumption sites. We need to save lives. That's what this is about. Last year, four times as many Americans died from overdose as they did from gun violence, and that's an appallingly high number. Um, I've been to Canada, I've viewed their sites, they've had no fatalities there. They're in community-based health centers, so folks can, you know, when did you last have a, a hep C test? When did you have an HIV test? And it's a way to bring people into the healthcare network. They may not yet be ready for treatment, but at least there are some supports around them for when, when they are, and let's keep folks alive in the meantime. And then on the prevention side, we have a CHAMP program, which are community-based prevention efforts. It's only funded halfway. It's only in about half of the state. We need to do a much, much better job of getting those prevention funds out there. We need to do a much better job getting Narcan out on the streets, test strips out on the streets. Again, the goal is to keep people alive, so we need to move more in that direction. And, and we need to um, get back to school-based mental health because that's when a lot of this starts. That's when people begin self-medicating. I have, I think, 21 different school districts in my district. And when you speak with them, you know, obviously everyone wanted more money. You know, fortunately, working with our, our great friends in the assembly, we made historic investments in, in education and foundation aid but they still desperately want money for mental health services in the schools. I think that's vital and it's entwined. And then finally, I, I think the last thing I would, would, would add is from a statewide political perspective, we need the big picture leadership. It's not just OASIS, it's not just OMAs, uh, OMH. So many other agencies need to be involved, whether it's, whether it's corrections, whether it's DCJS, whether it's a court system, whether it's the education system, um, every agency in New York State has a role to play. And we need to have the leadership from the top. And that's why I'm so excited uh, with a fresh start with Governor Hochul 
that we can have a big picture um, plan and everybody knows where they fit into the plan from a statewide perspective. So we continue to work very actively in this space. Um, we have a lot of great colleagues in the assembly and, and colleagues in the Senate. You know, one of the things that, that is really um, uh, refreshing, we hear a lot about partisanship uh, in the Senate. This is a nonpartisan issue. We are all on board on this. We have Republican members on our, on our task force and we, we strive to work in a nonpartisan manner because it's not Republicans or Democrats dying, it's all of our kids who are dying and impacted. So, you know, I, I'm really impressed by the, the roster of speakers you have, um, would love to work with you. If any of you wanna get in touch with us, if we can be of help, please call my Albany office. Happy to set up either a Zoom or a, a sit down in person. I'm happy to come out to you. There is so much more work to be done and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, that was great. Um, and you keyed off some questions in my head, but I will turn it over to Assemblyman Steck. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, and thank you for having me in this program. Uh, I remember when I was a young attorney, first starting out in the area of civil rights and employment law, and I had a client and we were settling a sex discrimination case against uh, a, uh, an insurance and investment company. And when we were doing the agreement, my client asked me if I could get her lifetime health insurance. And I said, well, how, you know, I can't do that because to get health insurance, you have to remain an employee. I could get you money. It might be used to buy health insurance, but I can't get you health insurance. And then I said, well, why are you so concerned about that? You're a 40 year old successful woman. And um, she said, well, hepatitis C. I said, how did you ever get that? Intravenous drug user. And what that told me was that, you know, how definitely possible it is to achieve recovery and to move on and have great success in whatever area of life you are in. Another point I'd like to make is I think sometimes advocates in this area assume that the legislators they're speaking to don't have the same experiences that they have. And that's, I assure you, not the case. So uh, the, uh, I strongly agree with Senator Harkerman, everything he said, except for two things. The first is this concept of how we achieve integrated treatment. So the conventional wisdom appears to be that if we merge OMH and OASIS, miraculously we'll have integrated treatment. There is a bill, which I believe that I am told the senator's office wrote, but Senator Jackson carries it, that provides for integrated treatment, but uh, does it without the merger of the agencies. Uh, I'm an old political science student, and uh, Max Weber taught uh, us that bigger bureaucracies are not better bureaucracies. In addition, Doing it in the budget doesn't make a lot of sense because the budget is very, very vague. For example, the last effort we saw at this combination basically said that the commissioner of all mage will have all authority they need to do whatever they want to do. And that's not, that's not something which I think is responsible legislation. I do think the bill that Senator Jackson carries on integrated treatment uh, is a much better approach. The second, uh, comment I wanna make on this is, again, dealing with uh, personal experiences without going into great detail. Uh, one of the problems that you have in this area is that the psychiatrists who address mental illness, if they have a case of a co-occurring disorder will say, we can't diagnose the mental illness because we don't know whether the cause of it is 
simply the drug use or what the underlying uh, uh, mental illness is. So even, you know, I'm a very strong supporter of the legalization of marijuana. I don't believe it belongs in the criminal justice system, but many of those who uh, criticize legalization on the grounds that uh, excessive use of marijuana can lead to psychosis uh, are correct, actually. That doesn't mean that the criminal justice system and prison is the place for this thing. It doesn't mean that continuing the distribution system in the hands of organized crime is the right way to address it. So uh, I, I feel we have a long way to go on this concept of, of integrated treatment. I really must stress that the medical community uh, if, if that's who you're dealing with, uh, are not prepared to make mental health diagnoses when there is drug involvement. A second area, which I dissent from about you know, half the members of the legislature, is this concept that we can get all the funding we need within existing budget parameters and that the money is just going to drop from the sky like manna from heaven. It's not. And unless we find a different way of funding state government, uh, we are never going to be able to fully fund any of these programs. The state budget is a series of well-meaning, partially funded programs. I think maybe only the, full, only the, the only fully funded uh, things in the state are the governor's office and maybe the speaker's staff. But uh, really, on the side of what our not-for-profit communities engage in, it's all a series of incompletely funded programs. So uh, I think if we're unwilling to explore what are the best ways to raise revenue in this state, uh, we can't provide all the funding that the Senator and I would certainly like to see. But, uh, with those exceptions, uh, everything Senator Harkham said is absolutely correct. We are working on a bill to, uh, with respect to housing, and this was uh, quite an issue on Long Island, less so where I am, but there are people who uh, market residences as so-called sober homes. And anybody who lives there has to be sober or sober or you're kicked out. Well, it's not a great concept because, first of all, there's absolutely no regulation of these things. And uh, if one person starts using, it can spread like wildfire to the whole residence. So, and simply kicking a person out is not doing anything to address their long-term recovery. So we have legislation where we're trying to say that if you want to hold yourself out to the public as operating a sober home, you, uh, you have to have, uh, at, at a very minimum, a, a case act, a, a substance abuse counselor licensed by the state available during the day, and also availability of psychological or psychiatric treatment. I'm not saying you have to have a staff member qualified to do that, but some connection, some availability. One of the reasons why in the OASIS model, which is often based on peer counseling, and certified um, uh, alcohol and substance abuse counselors, is that on the flip side of the coin, on the medical side, there are actually extremely few providers available. So in dealing with one psychiatrist, he told me that when he first started practicing in the capital region, there were 50 psychiatrists in private practice. He said, today there's eight. Uh, one of the solutions that we've looked at legislatively is actually to uh, decrease the qualifications needed to diagnose mental illness. Uh, while that might make sense for some aspects of medicine, I mean, Reading an x-ray and diagnosing a broken leg is one thing, uh, but you know, having a really good psychiatrist who can get to the heart of mental health issues uh, is a difficult proposition, and so, or psychologist. And I 
don't believe the right solution is simply to say uh, that we can have the equivalent of CASACs diagnosing medical uh, mental illness. In fact, there was a bill that would have given more authority to CASACs and uh, we did amend the bill so that it would provide that they could refer someone for a psychological treatment. So uh, I think there are profound obstacles to success in this area. The professionals themselves haven't agreed on exactly how to deal with this question of the intersection between mental health and substance abuse. Uh, and so uh, we are you know, looking forward to the next session. I'm sure there'll be some very good legislation. And I am a strong supporter of the integrated services bill. Uh, I am very skeptical of the creation of a much larger bureaucracy. One of the problems in government is that uh, for that oftentimes a model didn't work in the past. So a new model was created. The new model doesn't work. And then we say, let's go back to the old model that didn't work. Uh, and you know, it reminds me of the United States government when they decided that a lot of the Rooseveltian economic reforms didn't work anymore. So we're going to get rid of them and we're going to we're going to go in a, a, a new direction or a free market direction. And then we have the financial crisis of 2008. It's the same thing here. There was a reason that Oasis was broken off as a separate agency. And we can't forget what that reason was um, and just say, well, we're going to miraculously go back to the prior regime, although in a different way, and assume it's going to get it's going to get the job done. I think it's more important for us to legislate what the program is for integrated treatment rather than to uh, merge agencies and give the authority to a gubernatorial appointee to simply do whatever he or she wishes. Thank you. Um, Senator, um, you know, do you have, you know, I would, I have a small perspective on this issue of OASAS and OMH. And I, I'd be interested in what both of you think. I, I think, and I don't want to get bogged down in that specific issue if you folks would prefer to discuss other things. I think the other issue when you combine agencies is everyone hears something a little different. In my old job, um, you know, when I had to worry about budgets um, and some of the things the assemblyman mentioned about where we were getting enough money to do certain things, hearing something like an OASIS OMH merger might perk my ears up but not because it was for better treatment necessarily. And so I hear that piece of this, you know, and since I've left, you know, that life behind, I hopefully can think about- Happily, I hope. Uh, yes, I, thank you. Um, I hope, <laughs> but I get the Senator's point too, which is sometimes, it, you know, it gets to this whole argument where, you know, if we keep banging our heads against the wall that it's both a mental health problem and a substance abuse problem, then how do we fix it if, if these two entities aren't coordinated? So I, I get that issue. I, I really do. I, but Senator, I don't you know. You know, Robert, if I, if I could just say a, a quick thing so we don't get bogged down. And, and I certainly respect where Phil is coming from. And we'll continue to have these discussions and negotiations. We're getting $100 million. OASIS is getting $100 million from the federal government this year uh, in, in a SAMHSA grant. There'll be another $100 million next year. And thanks to the leadership of the Attorney General, over 
the next decade, we will be getting several hundred more million dollars. So we will be getting the kind of funding that we need. Once the marijuana legislation is up and the taxation is rolling in, 20% of that revenue is, is dedicated to treatment. So, um, you know, I, I think Phil's right to the point that we'll never have enough, but we, we will have a lot more than we do now. And the point is, do we spend that wisely? Um, and, and are we just putting money back into the same system? You know, if you talk to parents who've lost children, they've been through the treatment mill six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. And every time they came out, they relapsed because the underlying mental illness was not diagnosed and not treated. So, you know, we can, we can talk about the different ways to address that. And I'm not saying, you know, I have all the answers and Phil's not saying he has all the answers. You know, we as a government, we should be having this policy debate. But I think, I think unless we, we address that underlying issue, you know, we're not best serving the people we wanna serve and we're not, um, we're not using these dollars in the best way possible. So I would um, comment on sort of the, the historical origins of OASAS are, and a lot of alcohol and drug treatment programs are still in the 12-step approach. And actually that doesn't really have a lot of scientific validity, but it's the way we've been doing things. And the, uh, with respect to the family, they are saying the correct thing, which is, well, we went to rehab many, many times. The underlying mental health issues aren't being addressed, and that's because of the drug treatment system. That's where I have an issue, which is it may not be because of the drug treatment system. It, not, it may not be because the drug treatment system is actively preventing mental health treatment, because when you're in one of these situations and you reach out for mental health treatment, you find out that unless someone is hospitalized for mental illness, they can't get mental health treatment. And even when they are hospitalized in the best of circumstances, the physicians say, we don't know how to treat you because of your drug use. So I think this equation has a lot of variables in it, uh, not simply making mental health treatment available during the course of uh, alcoholism and substance abuse treatment, which I certainly 110% agree with, but we have to get to the underlying point, which is why the psychiatry community feels they can't diagnose mental illness if there's drug abuse involved. I don't know how much time we still have, but can I ask a quick related question? Today, again, some of the panelists this morning talked about research being very focused on evidence-based kind of results, but that those researchers weren't always talking to the people on the ground and the families, and I think both of you mentioned that. Um, it, and so you, we were sometimes seeing research not matching up with what people were actually feeling on the ground, especially during COVID. It, is that something that's reached um, both of you? And how do we how do we deal with that? Well, to to the point. Um, one of, one of the things that, that we've been hearing a lot lately is about how New York has lagged other states in the use of data, particularly um, in A, in terms of evidence-based treatment outcomes, but, but also our systemic outcomes. You know, through, through Medicaid, we have hundreds of thousands of case files that, that we could be tracking how we as a state and how we as a healthcare system, i.e. Medicaid, are doing and serving this population. 
and and we do very little with that data and so that's something that that this coming session i'm going to be spending a lot of time with states like massachusetts and other states are much further along in using data um, so that we can better determine outcomes at the local level but also systemically throughout new york state Senator, we at Rockefeller would love to engage you on any data related analysis that that you would put forward. Um, you know what? Let's 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 set up a meeting after after this symposium. So I would yield to the senator on that. I have not had a lot of discussion since uh, in the one year that I've been chair about what studies are being conducted and so forth. One point I didn't make in my remarks that I want to, that I think is very important, is when it comes to behavioral health, actually it's better to be on Medicaid than in private insurance. That is shocking. And um, uh, the, the goal of parity is not being achieved. There are certainly very popular insurance plans where the providers won't take them because they don't pay enough. Uh, so, uh, but Medicaid has all kinds of things that private insurance doesn't give you access to, which is all part of this integrated treatment approach, which is, for example, in Medicaid, I'm not great with acronyms or, or you know, uh, terms of art, but you are given a case manager who can coordinate your services that you need in private insurance. You got to set it up all on your own and half the providers don't take your insurance. So it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is very, very, very challenging. And I do think we have not achieved parity uh, despite a lot of well uh, meaning and, and effective legislation, but uh, the behavioral health in the, in the private insurance world is still quite substandard. Um, I think we are close to the end of our time that was allocated. I, I again want to thank um, Senator Harkum and, and Assemblyman Stack. This was great. I think it was good as a dialogue, and I think you both raised lots of issues. I do think, again, I think you both raised this with the new governor and with um, where we are um, in the world. I think there are opportunities that are different today than they probably were even last year. So I think, and especially coming out of COVID. So I wanna, again, thank you both um, this was great.